रहीम अस्सलाम वालेकुम मैं तिलावत कुरान पाक के लिए दावत देती हूं एडवोकेट फखर को अऊजु बिललाहि मिनश शैतानिर रजीम बिस्मिल्लाहिर रहमानिर रहीम सुभान रब्बिक रब्बिल इज्जत अम्मा यसिफून وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين صدق الله العظيم جزاك الله मैं नात के लिए दावा देती हूं गुलाम सरवर साबरी एडवोकेट साहब को दुरूद पाक पढ़ना सर सल्लल्लाहु अलैहि का या रसूल अल्लाह व सलाम अलैहि का या हबीब तेरा मकाम या नबी शुक्रिया अदा करती हूँ कि आज आप इस प्रोग्राम को रौनक बख्शने के लिए पहुंचे और कामयाब बनाने के लिए आए अब मैं तलत महमूद जैदी साहब को सोशल पे बुलाऊंगी कि वो आगा मोहम्मद अली खान साहब का मुकम्मल तारुफ करवाए बिस्मिल्लाम लेक्चर सीरीज का ये छठा लेक्चर है और आप सबका मशहूर हूँ कि आप इस दिलचस्पी के साथ हमारे साथ चल रहे हैं इस प्रोग्राम का अख्ताम जो है वो लाव मोड्स पे होगा और आपको मैं शुरू में भी अर्ज़ कर चुका हूँ कि ये एक अच्छे कैश प्राइजेज़ होंगे आप बच्चों के लिए और जो लोग इसकी जिनकी हाजिरी सेवेंटी परसेंट तक होगी वो एलिजिबल हैं उस लाव मोड्स में पार्टिसपेट करने के और मेरी खुशबी के इमरान अफरा सियासा भी तशरीफ़ लाएँ आज इसी तरह मेम्बर पंजाब बार कौंसल 
بشار عبد اللہ خان صاحب تشریح رکھتے ہیں انصر نواز مرزا صاحب سینئر کونسل ہیں اسی طرح فخر صاحب بیٹھے ہیں تو اس معاملے کو ہم نے آگے بڑھانا ہے ایک ہائی کورٹ کی پریکٹس کو ہم نے فوکس کیا ہوا ہے تو ہماری جتنی بھی لیکچر سیریز ہے اس کا جو ہے وہ مین مطمع نظر جو ہے وہ اس پریکٹس میں آپ کو فیسلیٹیٹ کرنا ہے گائیڈ کرنا ہے ایجوکیٹ کرنا ہے تو اس سے پہلے بھی بڑے اچھے لیکچرز ہو چکے ہیں میں ابھی عمران افرا سے آپ سب سے ملا تو میں نے کہا آپ کا لیکچر ہمارا ابھی تک سپر ایٹ جا رہا ہے تو اسی سیریز کو آگے بڑھاتے ہیں میں نے آغا علی صاحب سے بارہا ریکویسٹ کی کافی شروع میں تو میرے قابو نہیں آئے لیکن بالآخر انہوں نے میری جو ہے وہ استدا کو مانا کیونکہ ان بچوں کا بھی حق ہے اور میرے لیے فخر کی بات ہے آپ بات ہے آپ بار کا ساسا ہیں تعارف آغا صاحب کا کچھ اس طریقے سے ہے کہ نائنٹین نائنٹی ون میں آپ نے سر سید کالج سے گریجویشن کی انیس سو پچانوے میں آپ نے پنجاب یونیورسٹی کے لا کالج سے لا گریجویشن کی انیس سو چھیانوے کا آپ کا ڈسٹرک بار کا لائسنس ہے نائنٹین نائنٹی ایٹ میں آپ ہائی کورٹ بار اسوسیشن کے ممبر بنے دو ہزار نو میں ہمارے ساتھ میں مرزا صاحب تھے آغا صاحب تھے ہم سارے سپریم کورٹ کے ایڈوکیٹ انرول ہوئے دو ہزار سولہ میں آپ نے بطور ایڈیشنل جج جو ہے وہ خدمات انجام دی اور ہمیں فخر ہے کہ آپ نے نہایت محنت سے بہت بہترین پرفارم کیا وی وی آر پراؤڈ آف دیٹ اس کے علاوہ آپ کی سپریم کورٹ سے تیس سے زیادہ رپورٹڈ کیسز ہیں تو آئی فیل پراؤڈ یو آر ہیئر آپ سے ریکویسٹ ہے کہ آپ تشریف لائیں اور ہماری رہنمائی فرمائیں یہ آج کا لیکچر جو ہے وہ فوکسڈ ہے ریڈ جورسڈکشن کے اوپر اور اسپیشلی میں نے ان کو جو ریکویسٹ کی تھی وہ دو ریٹ ریٹ آف مینڈیمس اینڈ پروہیبیشن پہ ان کو ریکویسٹ کی تھی کہ اس کو ضرور فوکس کیجیے گا اور اس کے علاوہ میں نے ان سے ریکویسٹ کی تھی کہ تھوڑا سا جو ڈرافٹنگ کا انسر ہے جس میں ہم سارے میں تو خیر فوجداری کے وکیل تو بالکل ہی ویک ہوتے ہیں تو اس میں بھی ہماری رہنمائی فرمائیں تو میں میرے سیکٹری صاحب تشریف میں آئے ہیں جی میں انہیں خوش آمدید کہتا ہوں اور آغا صاحب سے ریکویسٹ کرتا ہوں کہ آئیں ریسٹورینٹ پہ اور اپنا لیکچر کریں آغوز باللہ میں نے شہید اوان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم دی آنریبل پریزیڈنٹ ہائی کورٹ بار اسوسییشن سیکٹری صاحب میمبرز آف ایگزیکٹیو کمیٹی رسپیکٹیڈ سیریر میمبرز آف دی بار پردرز اینڈ سسٹر اسلام علیکم I am overwhelmed by the kind words of the worthy president and I feel deeply honored to stand here today and address this prestigious gathering. I am grateful to the president and executive members to grant me an opportunity to share my views on the topic assigned to me. Firstly, heartiest congratulations to High Court Bar Association for arranging series of these lectures, which is a very good initiative for all of us and especially for young entrants to the High Court Bar who are taking in keen interest in these lectures. Today's topic, writ jurisdiction, is of vital importance if you are practicing in high court. This jurisdiction is exercised by superior courts and has direct bearing on well-being of the society. This jurisdiction is based on age-old principle. There is no wrong on the face of this earth which cannot be redressed under the constitutional jurisdiction of high court where no other remedy is provided under the law. Constitution, as we all know, is an act of extraordinary legislation by which people establish the structure and mechanism of their government and in which they prescribe fundamental rights and rules to regulate the motion of several parts. Constitution of Pakistan, like any other constitution, determines most desirable way of life of people of Pakistan and creates a government, organizes the government by creating the three principal organs of the state, that is, the legislature, the executive, and the judiciary, and defines their powers and duties, and creates written boundaries for each of them. The topic, though, is very vast, but the scope of my lecture in the given time will comprise of, number one, meaning and origin of writ, development of writ jurisdiction in Pakistan, concept of judicial review, five kinds of writ under Article 199 of the Constitution of 1973, practice and procedure and drafting, and unwritten restrictions which restrict the relief with, with, uh, under various precedents. And lastly, 
the limitation and concept of latches. Now to speak more generally on the subject, I will start with a brief account of origin and development of writs and what it means. A writ means a written order by a superior court commanding the party to whom it is addressed to perform or cease to perform a specified act. Judicial Dictionary of Words and Phrases by Stroud defines the writ as a writ is the process by which civil proceedings in the High Court are generally commenced. These are issued in the name of Reining Monarch for doing or not doing some act or thing. In Blackstone's Dictionary, it is defined as a writ is a mandatory letter from the King in Parliament sealed with his seal and directed to the Sheriff of the country wherein the wrong is committed or supposed to be requiring him command, command the wrongdoer or party accused thereto to the, brought to the justice and complainant or else to appear in the court and answer the allegations against him. In concise Oxford Dictionary, a writ is defined as inter alia, a form of written command in the name of sovereign, state or court issued to an official or other person directing him to act or abstain from acting some way. The practice and procedure of writs commenced in the first century by the normal rule, Norman rule in England. Historically a royal prerogative, the inception of writ jurisdiction lies within the era of William I, also known as William the Conqueror. The Norman king of England, upon the start of William I, Anglo-Saxon judicial system also came into existence and it brought along with it the concept of writ jurisdiction. Anciently, writ was nothing more than a written directive from a king witnessed and bearing his seal directed to a royal official or to an individual or group of individuals ordering to do or refrain from doing a designated act. With the passage of time, the English legal system was redefined further and with the dispensation of justice, judges were appointed by the king himself and they collectively were known as the king's bench. Judges in the king's bench used to discharge the duties of the king in judicial matters and only served at his pleasure. Further evolution of the judicial system led to the birth of Court of Chancery in the 14th century. Court of Chancery was the first court empowered to issue writs independently to the crown. The court still exists and is called the Chancery Division of High Court in England. The Judicator Act of 1973 abolished the Court of Chancery and other courts and consolidated superior courts which exercised the jurisdiction to issuance for issuance of writs. In 1753, the East India Company set up a mayor's court at Madras, Bombay and Calcutta and then ran side by side with the native courts which administered justice under the civil and criminal branch of law. In the Indo-Pak subcontinent, the president Presidency courts at Calcutta, Madras and Bombay were established by the Indian High Court Act 1862. The High Courts continued to exercise the power to issue prerogative writs within the limits of their respective original jurisdiction. They did not have the power to issue such writs upon Mufassil courts or tribunals or to the persons outside the limit of the Presidency towns. No other High Court except these High Courts were vested with power to issue prerogative writs under Section 45 of the Specific Relief Act 1877. But this was not made applicable to Lahore High Court, Sindh Chief Court and Courts of Judicial Commissioner at Peshawar and Quetta. After creation of Pakistan and until we have the, our first constitution of 1956, Pakistan was being governed under the Government of India Act 1935. As it was originally elected, there was no provision conferring power of High Court to issue writs. It was in 1954 that a new section 223A was inserted in the Act of 1935 which vested High Courts in Pakistan with powers to issue writs to any person or authority including government. Article 2, 223A read every High Court shall have power throughout the territories in relation to which it exercises jurisdiction to issue any person or authority including in appropriate cases any government with those territories, writs, including writs in the nature of habeas corpus, mandamus, certiorari, prohibition, and co -varanto. In 1956, Pakistan had its first constitution and part 9 of which was earmarked for judiciary. Article 170 of the constitution dealt with powers of high court to issue writs 
एंड लेटन वर्ड्स दैट इज प्रोहिबिशन मैंडेमस सोशरारी हेबस कापस एंड को वरंटो वर यूज इन दिस आर्टिकल इन जनवरी नाइनटीन सिक्सटी टू द कैबिनेट फाइनली अप्रूव द टेक्सट ऑफ द न्यू कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन इट वॉज प्रोमोगेटेड प्रोमोगेटेड बाई प्रेजिडेंट अयूब खान ऑन फर्स्ट ऑफ मार्च नाइनटीन सिक्सटी टू which was to take effect, take effect from 8th of june 1962 it contained 250 articles divided into 12 parts these latent names of the writs were dispensed with in the constitution of 1962 on recommendation of mr manzoor qadir advocate then foreign minister justice fazal kareem in his book judicial review of public actions by honoring the work of mr manzoor qadir main draftsman of the constitution of 1962 who served as the chairman of the constitutional committee which in eventually formulated constitution of 1962 wrote and i quote the constitution of islamic republic of pakistan 1962 introduced presidential system of government in pakistan but what it deserved to be remembered for is what it, it codified the law of judicial review in its article 98 and that i understand it is the original original contribution of this branch of law in doing so not only did it rid the law of the latent names what is more important it produced order and consistency which the writ of writ jurisdiction in england was lacking and reducing itself to a self contained proposition a rare combination of skills of a legal draftsman and intellectual power of a great lawyer even in england since 1938 these latent names have been parted away and the word for the writs now used is prerogative orders the powers of judicial review is now a statutory power and application for judicial review are governed by statutory rules then thereafter we finally had the constitution of islamic republic of pakistan 1973 it provided constitutional remedies to protect fundamental rights part 2 chapter 1 deals with fundamental rights of a person this part is also called heart of the constitution which provides right to life liberty equality before law freedom of speech and expression liberty of thought belief and worship culture and education right of fair trial etc and it is exercised where there is no other remedy provided under the law words filing of writ or writ is not used in the constitution the word used are application by aggrieved party or any person Article 199 of the Constitution confers wide powers of judicial review on the provincial high courts in Pakistan as compared to powers of Supreme Court of Pakistan under Article 184 3 of the Constitution. The power under Article 199 of the Constitution to the high courts are wider and varied. These powers cover more areas than mere enforcement of fundamental rights. It is clear from the language of Article 199 that jurisdiction of high court is discretionary. and is exercised by observing limitations laid down in article 199 itself and on the principles and precedents which though not provided in article 199 are otherwise well recognized and practiced under article 199 the executive judicial and quasi judicial orders of the person as defined in article 199.5 can be challenged on the ground of being violative of any law or rules etc on the other hand article 183 of the constitution the supreme court only interferes in cases of a violation of fundamental rights which are of public importance whereas there is no such restriction on condition provided under article 199 this means the high court can take cognizance of cases which discloses violation of any fundamental rights irrespective of whether or not it contains element of public importance or not regarding element of public importance if you are interested there are two judgments i will be uh, referring which must be read by the youngsters pld 2012 supreme court 224 and the other one is ia sherwani's case 1991 scmr 1041 in 2012 supreme court 224 i had the honor to appear in supreme court and argued for 5 days and it was regarding closing of bsl school because after 18th amendment the schools were being closed bsl basic schools all over pakistan and 5 lakh students were to go home so this act was challenged and the federation was not willing to continue these schools provincial were not willing to take the schools so this was challenged directly in the supreme court matter of public importance and this petition was allowed ultimately on the touchstone of article 25a of the uh, constitution that mayors must be taken first and children cannot go home uh, and cannot be deprived of education <coughs> 
the power of high court in pakistan are salutary check on the mischief or arbitrary use of the power of government functionaries or public office holders these are extraordinary powers known as extraordinary remedies these powers are different from those powers of which high court exercises under other laws like civil procedure court and criminal procedure court now my next uh, topic is judicial review what it means judicial review is a process under which executive legislative and administrative actions are subject to review by the judiciary a court with authority for judicial review may invalidate laws acts and government actions that are incapable or encroaches upon constitutional prohibition an executive decision may be invalidated for being unlawful or a statute may be invalidated for violating the terms of constitution two classic examples of these cases of judicial reviews are the uh, in the cases of federation of pakistan versus shaukat ali mia pld 1999 supreme court page 1026 and the other one is sardar farooq ahmed khan laghari versus federation of pakistan pld 1999 supreme court 57 in these two cases after five nuclear devices were tested by pakistan emergency was imposed and fundamental rights were suspended and simultaneously a foreign exchange temporary restriction act 1998 was promulgated imposing restrictions on opening of foreign currency accounts and freezing of existing accounts and converting deposits of overseas pakistanis into pakistani rupees at much low rate two important matters for judicial review came before supreme court imposed one was regarding imposing of emergency which was challenged directly under article 183 1843 of the constitution Uh, by sardar farooq ahmed khan lagari and the other matter was challenged uh, uh, the wires of act of 1998 petitions were filed before the high court the writ petitions were dismissed in limine intra court appeals were filed and those were allowed by full bench of the lahore high court the decision was upheld by the honorable supreme court with certain modifications and it was held that the act of 1998 was ultra wires of the constitution because it encroaches upon right of a person to have property and use it whereas regarding the other case sardar farooq ahmed lagari's case the emergency was held to be valid but suspension of fundamental rights was declared illegal and it was set aside so judicial review is one of the checks and balances in the separation of powers the power of judiciary to supervise the legislative and executive branches when the latter exceeds its their authority the doctrine varies between jurisdictions so the procedure and scope of judicial review may differ between within the countries judicial review is a doctrine according to which the courts are entitled in the exercise of judicial power of the state to examine and decide the questions a of contract constitutional validity of any law b it is the result of primary or subordinate legislation or b of the constitutional validity or lawfulness of a decision action or inaction of a person a body in relation to the exercise of public function the judicial power is the power to decide that includes the power to interpret the core function of a judge is to decide by applying the correct law to the facts of the case before him the necess- this necessarily involves interpretation of law in order that it may be so applied the term term judicial review has not been defined or used in the constitution of pakistan nor in india or in america it has been used in english legislative instruments in civil procedure court amendment number no. 4 rule 2000 it is defined as a claim for judicial review means a claim to review the lawfulness of an enactment or a decision action or failure to act in relation to the exercise of public functions according to lord beckingham the judicial review is defined as a power of the court to see that power that public powers are lawfully exercised and according to lindley it is judicial review is defined as no duty of the court which is more important to observe and no power of the court which is more important to enforce than its power of keeping public bodies within their rights besides the supervision of inferior courts and tribunals judicial review provides means by which judicial control of administrative actions is exercised now before i take up the five kinds of writs i would like to refer few words about the writs by justice M R Kiani former chief justice of West Pakistan 
West Pakistan High Court, uh, he was a great admirer of the writ jurisdiction. While addressing Sindh High Court Bar Association on 11th of December 1958, emphasizing the importance of this jurisdiction, he said, and I quote, Mandamus and certiorari are flowers of paradise, and the whole length and breadth of Pakistan is not wide enough to contain their perfume. And further stated, God fulfills himself in many ways, and that we the judges are the humble instruments of his fulfillment. Red jurisdiction is the modern manifestation of God's players, and God's players dwell in the High Court." Unquote. Regarding Justice Kiani, with permission of Mr. President, a few more words. As a judge and then Chief Justice, this is for the consumption of youngsters as well, as a judge and then Chief Justice, his speeches at various forums were widely covered by national press because of the rare combination of intellect, wit, courage, integrity he personified. His characteristic band of humor and witty remarks did not spare even the rulers. In the last four years of his life, he was considered as the most popular speaker of the country. A collection of his speeches have appeared in the form of various books like The Whole Truth, Not the Truth, Half Truth, and A Judge May Laugh, and Afkare Parishan. Justice Kiani retired in October 1962 and could not make it to the Supreme Court because of his open criticism of the regime in power. In recognition of his work, the citizens of Lahore arranged a farewell reception in his honor in which he, na he was named as Lisane Pakistan, which means the voice of Pakistan. In his reply, Justice Kiani said that this title was dearer to him than Nishane Pakistan. Then he went on, went on to say that his purpose in delivering such satirical speeches was to keep the morale of the people high in a period of gloom and darkness. In one of his memorable comments, he wrote, there are quite a few, I, I quote, there are quite a few thousand men who would rather have the freedom of speech than a new suit of clothes, and it is these that form a nation, not the office hunters. Now I come to the five kinds of rates. The rates of mandamus and prohibition are defined in Article 199A, 1A, Roman 1. It reads 199.1, subject to the constitution, a high court may, if it is satisfied that no other adequate remedy is provided by law, A, on the application of any aggrieved party, make an order, Roman 1, directing a person performing within the territorial jurisdiction of the court, functions in connection with the affairs of the federation, a province or a local authority to refrain from doing anything he is not permitted by law to do or to do anything he is required by law to do. So mandamus and prohibition though not written in this but it literally mandamus means we command whereas prohibition means to stop or to forbid. The first part of article 199 1a Roman 1 confers jurisdiction upon high court to make an order directing a person performing functions in connection with affairs of the federation, a province or a local authority to refrain from doing anything he is not permitted by law to do or order prohibition commonly known as writ of prohibition. The second part confers jurisdiction upon the high court to make an order directing a person to do something he is required by law to do. This writ or order is commonly known as mandamus. Mandamus literally means command. It differs from writs of prohibition and certiorari as it demands some activity on part of the body or person to whom it is addressed to do or perform a public duty. In other words, mandamus is a command directed to state officer or inferior court requiring performance of a particular duty specified therein. Describing the writ of mandamus, Supreme Court in the case of Secretary Finance versus Ghulam Saftar, 2005 SCMR 534 held, mandamus is a high prerogative writ of a most extensive remedial nature and is in the form of a command issued from High Court directing any person or subordinate court to do a particular act and can be issued in cases where although there is an alternate remedy, but such mode of redress is less convenient, beneficial, and effective. The requirement of this writ of mandamus is that the petitioner must have a clear right 
The standards for issuing such writs were settled in the case of State v. Merajuddin in PLT 1959, Supreme Court 147. The case was under Article 170 of the Constitution of 1956. It was held that mandamus cannot be issued unless the petitioner shows that he has the right to compel the performance of some duty caused upon the other party. Thus, this writ can only be issued if the person has a legal right to performance of a legal duty of public nature and the authority against whom the writ is issued has a legal duty to perform the obligation. The main purpose of mandamus is to remedy defects of justice. It lies in the cases where there is specific right but no specific legal remedy for enforcing that right. Generally, it is not available in anticipation of any injury except when the petitioner is likely to be affected by an official act in contravention of his statutory duty or where an illegal unconstitutional order is made. The grant of mandamus is therefore an equitable remedy, the, excess, the exercise of which is governed by settled principles. Mandamus being a discretionary remedy, the application for it must be in good faith and for not achieving some indirect purpose. Acquiescence cannot be a bar to issue writ of mandamus provided the petitioner has a clear right which is being denied by some state functionary. The petitioner must satisfy the court that they have the legal right to performance of the legal duty as distinct from the mere discretion of the authority. Mandamus cannot be issued to enforce a contractual obligation. The only ex exception is where the facts are admitted. Similarly, no direction can be issued to the legislature to legislate a per particular law. This is based on independence of the legislature and arises directly from the uh, doctrine of trichotomy of powers. Now coming to the writ of prohibition, which means to stop or to forbid, and is dealt with Article 199, 1A, Roman 1 of the Constitution, which I have already read. The Constitution commands that no judicial or quasi-judicial authority can exceed its jurisdiction, and it, be, it, can, it can be exercised only by an aggrieved person. A writ of prohibition lies to prevent inferior tribunal or court or authority from exceeding its jurisdiction or even from assuming jurisdiction with, which does not vest in it. It is a preventive remedy that can be granted only when a legal proceedings are pending before the court or tribunal and if the case is finally disposed of and the decision is given by such subordinate court, writ of certiorari will lie as a curative remedy to quash the decision. Inferior courts take up hearing of a matter over which it has no jurisdiction, the person against whom the proceedings are taken can move the superior court for writ of prohibition or an order will be issued forbidding the inferior court from continuing the proceedings. On the other hand, if the court or tribunal hears the matter and gives a decision, the party agreed would have to resort to writ of certiorari against the final decision. Judicial discipline of the highest order has to be exercised whilst issuing the such rank of rents. The distinction between mandamus and prohibition is that the writ of prohibition differs from the writ of mandamus in that while mandamus commands activity, prohibition commands inactivity. The basic difference between writ of prohibition and certiorari is the writ of prohibition lies during pending proceedings, whereas certiorari lies when act has been done and it is subject to final determination of the court. Now coming to the next type of writ, which is certiorari, which means to be certified. It is dealt under Article 199, 1A, Roman 2 of the Constitution, which reads, Jurisdiction of High Court. Subject to the Constitution, a High Court may, if it is satisfied that no other remedy is provided by law, A, on the application of any aggrieved party, make an order declaring that any act done or proceedings taken within the territorial jurisdiction of the court by a person performing functions in connection with the affairs of federation, a province or a local authority has been done or taken without lawful authority and is of no legal effect. In all these three writs, certiorari, mandamus and prohibition, the application has to be of that of an aggrieved party, not otherwise. Grant of relief under constitutional jurisdiction of high court was intended to foster the administration of justice and turns down orders which were manifestly arbitrary, capricious and suffering from misreading of record. 
certiorari jurisdiction is based on the principle that wherever judicial jurisdiction is exercised by an inferior court or tribunal, it is in cases of abuse or excess of or li are liable to be corrected by King's Bank Division of the High Court. In other words, the High Court as delegate of supreme judicial authority from sovereign is liable for keeping the inferior courts or tribunal tribunals exercising such jurisdiction within their limits. It is manifest from above that though rate of certiorari, a high court is empowered to correct the errors committed by the inferior courts or tribunals and on the other hand to annul acts or proceedings taken by inferior bodies without any lawful authority. The court issuing writ of certiorari acts in exercise of supervisory and not appellate jurisdiction as regard the character and scope of certiorari will be issued for correcting errors of jurisdiction. Thus, the High Court is empowered to interfere in all cases of excess of jurisdiction, whether the person exceeding jurisdiction is a court, a judicial or quasi-judicial body, or a purely executive or administrative tribunal or officer, provided such body, authority or order is performing functions in connection with the affairs of federation, a province or a local authority, it is tried law that a writ of certiorari cannot be issued as a substitute of appeal or revision as its scope is limited and circumscribed to the eventualities mentioned therein. Courts though show caution and rarely interfere, but where the decision is against the express provision of law or some patent illegality, the High Court can interfere and even set, can set aside concurrent findings or order passed in revisional jurisdiction by civil court. For this, the reference can be made to the case of Muhammad Anwar versus Muhammad Alias Begum. PLD 2013 Supreme Court, page 255, in which this criteria has been settled. The other basic judgment on the point is Rahim Shah versus Chief Election Commissioner of Pakistan and another PLD 1973 Supreme Court, page 24. Now, coming to the next bit, habeas corpus and co-parento, which can be filed by any person, not necessarily an aggrieved person. Habeas corpus means you may have the body, or to produce a body or have his body, it is meant to remedy illegal detention. It is dealt under Article 199.1b, Roman 1 of uh, the, this article. It reads, on the application of any person, make an order directing that a person in custody within the territorial jurisdiction of the court be brought before it so that the court may satisfy itself that he is not being held in custody without lawful authority or in an unlawful manner. There is inspired saying that says that the condition upon which God has given liberty to man is eternal vigilance. This means that people must have the necessary education and awareness of most cherished right and he will have to assert it so that there is no invasion on his right. Issued to produce a person uh, who has been detained unlawfully, illegally or wrongly, uh, whether in a private custody or prison by an institution. Although basic and fundamental human rights are safeguarded and are enshrined and guaranteed in the Constitution of Islamic Republic of Pakistan 1973 under Article 4 which says to enjoy protection of law and to be tried in accordance with law which is inalienable right of every citizen and under Article 9, which says that no person shall be deprived of life and liberty save in accordance with law, and under, under Article 15 regarding freedom of movement, yet it is common knowledge that millions of law have of late become accustomed of showing flagrant disregard of these provisions of constitution. The writ of habeas corpus is used to secure the release of a person who has been detained unlawfully or without lawful justification. The article pro provides a process by which a person who is confined without legal justification may secure his release from his confinement. An application is more made supported by affidavit. If prima facie grounds are shown, the court directs notice of motion to be given to produce the detainee in court on the day fixed. And if no explanation is given by the person who has detained the detainee, an order is made for his release. In Pakistan, there is no codified law of habeas corpus. Uh, nonetheless, provisions are perimateria and akin to section 491 of the Code of Criminal Procedure. 
the empowerment of Sessions Court to exercise this jurisdiction was welcome and provided quicker relief and less expensive remedy. Next is the writ of co-warranto, which means under what authority? It is dealt with Article 199, Clause 1, B, Roman 2, and reads, requiring a person within the territorial jurisdiction of the court, holding or purporting to hold a public office, to show under what authority of law he claims to hold that office. Any person can file this writ, and latches is not a bar for filing this writ, as the continuation of a person illegally holding a office can be questioned. The power conferred upon the High Court by this clause is to require a person holding or purporting to hold the public office to show under what authority of law he claims to hold that office. Eligibility and competence of a person to hold a public office or post can be questioned and court can ask question that under what authority he or she is holding such office. The remedy under clause 1 sub clause B 2 of article 199 is available only against a person holding or purporting to hold a public office and is not available against the holder of a private office. The expression public office is not defined in 1973 constitution. It was defined in 1962 constitution to include any office of the service of Pakistan and membership of an assembly. That definition was not exhaustive and in any case the connotation of the expression public office is well known and that perhaps explain the absence of definition from the 1973 constitution. The definition of term public office has been adopted by the courts in Pakistan in Masood al Hassan versus Khadi Hussain case, PLD 1963 Supreme Court 203, as an office created by the state by character or by statute when the duties attached to the office are of public nature. This was reiterated in the case of MAU Khan versus M. Sultan, PLD 1974, Supreme Court, page 228. Burden lies on the relator who has brought this writ to show that the respondent has no right at all to hold a particular office and he has to prove it as uh, held in the basic judgment, PLD 1963, Supreme Court, 203, Masood al Hassan's case. This criteria for this type of writ was settled in the case, initially in the case of Muhammad Khan versus Lahore Cantonment Board, PLD 1964 Lahore 125 under 1962 constitution, wherein it was held, a proceedings for writ of co warranto is initiated to test the validity of an appointment of a public office and a petitioner does not seek to enforce a right of his as such, nor does he complain of non-performance of any duty towards him. What is questioned is the right of the respondent to hold a public office and he must not have his personal interest or say that this person holding the office is not competent and I may be appointed to that post for this writ of co warranto would not lie. The credentials of relator are very important and it must not be based on malafide. This was settled by Honorable Supreme Court in Muhammad Hanif Abbasi's case, PLD 2012, uh, 2018 Supreme Court, page 114 and Dr. Azizur Rahman Khan versus Government of Sindh and another 2004 SCMR page 1299. And regarding the uh, fact that he must himself not have an interest, the, uh, there's a very good judgment on, of Sindh High Court, P, 2019 PLC, CS page 1050. Now, lastly, I will come to the procedure, practice, and principles to be followed in High Courts. And uh, at the preliminary hearing, it is observed that the persons with less, less experience, when they come before the High Court, they are questioned regarding maintainability, question of latches, and so many other questions. So, my this next topic would cover that what are the things that you should be conscious of while drafting a red petition, so that you are not confronted with those questions. And you must know the basics regarding which this procedure is followed. So, the basic thing is, when you draft a red petition, you must know the, which parties are to be impeded, because sometimes some authority of government has to be impeded and only if official is impeded and then the youngsters face embarrassment in the court that they, were, they are asked to impede the party in the court. So in order to avoid that, you must know what should be the parties who are to be impeded as respondents in the writ petition. Now, I start with that the writ petitions, the procedure is regulated under Civil Procedure Court 
and this was held in the Hussain Baksh case versus uh, Hussain Baksh versus Settlement Commissioner case way back in 1970. The citation is PLD 1970 Supreme Court page one. Now you brought a writ petition. And sometimes notice is issued. Comments are are called report or paraphrase comments, but they are quite distinct from written statement. In an eventuality, this practice is becoming very obsolete now. If a writ petition is admitted for regular hearing, you are bound to file a written statement. If you don't file a written statement, then it will be taken as if the contents of the writ petition has been admitted as it is. There are two judgments on this point. Nazir Ahmed versus Nazir Ahmed Sabri versus MBR, 2003 YLR 861 and Mehboob Saber versus MBR 2003 MLD 1361. In both these cases, it was held by the High Court that since the respondents after it was admitted for regular hearing have not filed written statement, so they have admitted the contents of the writ petition as it is and they have not controverted it. Although paraphrase comments were filed in that case, but those were not considered. Then next is that for filing a writ petition, there is no limitation. There, if you have not filed a writ petition within a reasonable time, then the concept of latches is introduced, that this writ is hit by principle of latches. Now, latches means unreasonable delay in asserting a claim. So, the courts in different judgments have set what should be a reasonable time. It, was, it has been considered as three to four months. But this principle of latches of lately has, is considered as not a principle of universal application and has to and if the cause of action is recurring like payment of salaries etc then only on the question of latches the writ should not be dismissed there are two judgments on this uh, in Omar Bas case uh, PLD 2013 Supreme Court 268 and Taj Mohammed's case 2020 PLC CS 668 although the petitions were filed lately but it was considered that the since there was a recurring cause of action, so the relief was granted. So facts of facts and circumstances of each case has to be examined, and delay of two years was condoned because the party had a strong right in the case reported in 2021 20, SCMR 1313, 2009 SCMR 177, and delay of over one year was condoned because equity leaned in favor of the petitioner in the case reported in 2005 SCMR page 1 to 6. So it has been consistently held that if a person has a right, no court could dismiss the cause on the ground of latches if it defeated the cause or justice or will perpetuate injustice. So list cannot be decided on the question of latches alone. It has been held so in the case of Farzand Raza Nakvi versus Muhammad Deen 2004 SCMR page 400 where delay of Five, uh, five years was condoned because the petitioner had a strong case on merits. So since Limitation Act 1908 does not apply to the proceedings under Article 199, therefore an application for direction of refund of money illeg illegally levied and recovered cannot be dismissed on the ground of limitation. This was held so in Pfizer Laboratories case, PLD 1998 Supreme Court, page 64. Now, High Court, while exercising great jurisdiction, has no jurisdiction to substitute its finding with that of the inferior tribunal. It can only correct the defects. Then, factual controversy, if, you, if there are controversial facts, that cannot be decided in the exercise of great jurisdiction, and High Court cannot enter into inquiry or investigation of a disputed questions of fact, which require recording of evidence. In such cases, the matter should be decided by the respective trial courts as provided uh, under the law. Citation on this is Government of Pakistan versus Ghulam Nabi, PLD 2001, Supreme Court, page 415. The next practice that has been consistently followed that object of constitutional jurisdiction is enforcement of an existing right. It cannot be exercised to create or establish a legal right. You must have a right in existence already and that can be enforced through writ jurisdiction. Then if there is some alternate remedy provided under the law, this is bar for exercising writ jurisdiction. This question has been decided in innumerable cases. Provisions under clause 1 say that a high court may make an order 
if it is satisfied that there is no other remedy under the law. The consensus of course is that it is left to the discretion of the court to weigh whether or not an alternate remedy is adequate. The courts have further agreed that in some cases, even if alternate remedy is adequate but order is patently illegal, malafide or without jurisdiction, the court can still interfere. The extraordinary remedy under Article 199 is not a substitute for ordinary remedy of a suit and where the remedy claim is in substance a remedy available under the ordinary law then a suit and not the writ is the appropriate remedy. Where however an order is challenged in a writ petition and is decided on merits, suit on same question will not rise because under Article 201 that decision will become binding on the court in which if at all a suit is filed it will bound to be dismissed. Now the next is that the person who, whose rights have been infringed would be called an aggrieved person in Article 199 and only an aggrieved person can file three types of writ that I have already explained, mandamus, prohibition and certiorari. For habeas corpus and co-parento anyone can file the writ petition. The Supreme Court of Pakistan in the case of Fazal Deen versus Lahore Development Trust, Improvement Trust, PLD 1969, Supreme Court 223 held that it is not necessary that such a right must be existing in strict juristic sense, but it is enough for the applicant to disclose that he had a personal interest in the performance of a legal duty, which if not performed in a manner not permitted by law, would result in loss of some personal benefit or advantage or curtailment of a privilege or liability or franchise. Now against whom the writ can be filed? The grievance of an aggrieved person should be against a person who is performing functions within the territorial jurisdiction of the High Court in connection with affairs of federal government, a provincial government or a local authority. The High Court may direct such person to refrain from doing something he is not allowed to do by law and may also direct a person to do something he is required by law which a person is not doing or avoiding. A writ can be filed only against the state and it is not maintainable against private individuals or corporations. State has been defined in Article 7 of the Constitution and says, in this part, unless the context otherwise requires, the state means the federal government, Majlis Sura, parliament, a provincial government, a provincial assembly, and such local or other authorities in Pakistan as are empowered to impose any tax or cess. So as far as public interest litigation is concerned, number of petitions are filed on daily basis. The criteria has been settled regarding public interest litigation in the case of Signal Free Corridor, uh, case 2015 SCMR 1739, titled LDA versus Imrana Tawana. The youngsters must read this case because it touches all, several other grounds which have been the mood point of uh, uh, discussion in, since the inception of uh, Article 2A in the Constitution that whether it is a grown norm of the constitution or not or whether it is a substantive part of the constitution or not this issue has also been decided in this 2015 SCMR 1739. Now if the writ petition is filed to settle a person when data it must be must not be honored and there is a bar to file constitution petition against a matter which involves question of terms and conditions of service uh, that is not maintainable under Article 199, clause, sub clause 3 of the Constitution. And uh, regarding this, the basic judgment is 2007 SCMR page 54, which says that regarding terms and conditions of service or posting and transfer, no writ petition lies. Lastly, the sue motto jurisdiction. The sue motto jurisdiction can only can be exercised only by Supreme Court, and High Court has no power to exercise such jurisdiction. This has been recently settled in the case of Janze Malik versus Blochistan Public Procurement Regulatory Authority and others, 2018 SCMR page 414, and Mia Irfan Bashir versus Deputy Commissioner Lahore, PLD 2021 Supreme Court page 571. Now, if all these criteria are kept in mind, then you draft a petition that what are the shortcomings and on what grounds I can be knocked out. So that should be covered in the drafting of a writ petition. It has to be very simple, to the point, and you must state the facts first. And unlike the other, there is a departure for reading a writ petition, like in civil procedure court, you are required to state the facts and not the law. 
but here since the question is mostly on the legal premise so you can uh, quote the law under which you, you are filing the petition and also you should file the uh, question of maintainability of the writ petition and that if you are apprehending that you will pose the question that that should be covered in your drafting it should not be too lengthy because we have seen that some lengthy writ petitions people lose interest in reading it it should be precise to the point containing the facts and the law so this summarizes and i conclude my lecture and submit that powers under article 199 should be daringly exercised in appropriate cases as it is of great impact on the relation between the masses and the state and in case where action is found unwarranted exemplary costs should be imposed on delinquent officials this i conclude my lecture sir bahut shukriya bahut extensive aur bahut knowledgeable lecture aapne deliver kiya thank you sir ab questions and Shok answers sir shukriya sir sadiqi sir ko welcome sir sadiqi sir ko shukriya tanveer khan sir ko shukriya ansar nawaz mirza sir ko shukriya bishad ullah khan sir ko shukriya aur tamam यंगस्टर और सीनियर्स का बहुत बहुत शुक्रिया सर अलैक्म सर मोहम्मद सलमान सर मेरी क्वेश्चन इज इन महबूब अली मलिक केस द जजमेंट वाज पेंड डाउन इन 1960 लाहौर पेज 575 बाय द ऑनरेबल मंसूर कादिर एंड हिज लॉर्डशिप यूज्ड वन पर्शियन प्रोवर्ब दैट इफ द एंटी डॉट इज बीइंग ब्रॉट फ्रॉम इराक द विक्टिम ऑफ स्नेक बाइट विल बी डेड on the basis of this concept of writ jurisdiction was erected and he further said in order to invoke writ jurisdiction we have to see two things adequacy and efficaciousness of remedy how when we are drafting writ petition how these two things and what are those things which have to be looked at in order to maintain the writ petition and my second question is whether writ petition can be invoked against the illegal acts of armed forces or not so far as your first portion of your your question is concerned regarding maintainability of the writ so while drafting the writ you should be conscious of the recent precedents under which this writ petition can be hit by maintainability so you should be equipped with the case law and you can file a writ petition which is a more convenient and speedy remedy and if you fail you can still file a suit but that there are certain restrictions because if the writ is decided on merits then you cannot file the suit because the decision will be binding under article 201 on the civil court regarding the second question uh, jurisdiction of uh, to to issue a writ under article 1993 the from 2015 onwards there has been certain relaxation in it and if the ad order or the act complaint is patently illegal without jurisdiction coron non judis then the writ, writ can lie you can read the 2015 supreme court judgment exhaustive judgment on this point and recently some judgments on this Mela point Fidi. as well mela fidi more ka koi koi question ho kind sir up would you please explain latches again for the youngsters here yeah. latches means that the, the you should come to the court within a reasonable time the limitation is not applicable in writ, writ petition you can invoke the writ petition file a writ petition at any point of time what the court has considered is that it should be filed in a reasonable time and reasonable time has been given as 3 to 4 months if beyond that then if you have a strong case in merits then the judgments that i have mentioned only then in exceptional cases court will interfere but if you have been indolent you have been sleeping over your right and you have involved the right quite late then the court will not interfere interfere and the petition will be hit by latches so latches is a principle where although the limitation is not um, applicable but if the jurisdiction is invoked after a certain period of time that may be 3 to 4 months beyond that then the court will not interfere mashallah bada jaast baap ka lecture thank you aap ne mandir ko puja mein sunne diya ek aapne reference diya with reference to the writ of pandemas prohibition and sashradi a petitioner must be the aggrieved person whether there is any exception to this general rule with reference to writ writ of uh, three three types of writs the only exception that can be is the public interest litigation yeah. but there is very limited 
if there are certain criteria that judgments I have referred, a, that has as, to be as, fulfilled. As pro bono public. Pro bono public. Thank you. Regarding the interference of uh, provincial high courts regarding the uh, federal institutions operation, having operations in the various provinces, sir. Sorry? Sir, federal institutions operating within the jurisdiction of a province, we can seek this remedy of uh, interference by the High Court. Yes, because the, uh, there's a judgment on this point, point uh, 2010 PLC, in which this question has been examined, and it has stated that the Federation works at different, uh, different uh, uh, parts of the country, and the writ not necessarily to be filed in Assam or the High Court, it can be filed in other, other jurisdictions as well. Sir, what should be the reasonable time to so, define here? It can be three to four months, but the judgments I have referred. It, it can, it, even a writ was allowed, uh, which was filed after five years because the person had a right and there was a recurring cause of action. So there's no codified law, no, they are not written anywhere, but these are the precedents. Thank you, sir. There was then. Any other person? Sir, please. Assalamualaikum, sir. My question is that in recent times, uh, uh, we are actually witnessing a change in climate. And uh, there have been... Uh, numerous uh, environmental rights violation. So, uh, can I personally file a writ uh, regarding some environmental rights because they do not specifically, they are not specifically enshrined in the constitution. However, they can be linked to the right of life. But there, there is no codified way in which I can go for it. So, can there be any precedent which can help? But second, my question is, can court direct any uh, governmental official which are in uh, or any private entity which are uh, uh, which are you know creating some housing to try to break it down some trees so that also amounts to environment uh, damaging the environment without actually following the uh, EPA code and uh, PIPA. so uh, can you guide us for that you being the resident of Mari I know where you're coming from this under article 9 the right to life you are a real person because it, it is curtailing the right of right to life, so you can file a writ petition, and if the, you can uh, overcome the, the the criteria set by Supreme Court regarding the pro bono litigation, you can file in that capacity as well. And there is a pending matter regarding the cutting of trees in Murray in, in Lahore High Court WPD bench, and this this has been filed by the residents of Murray, and the High Court has taken cognizance of the matter. So in a, in a term, you are a grieved person. Margara Hills case was Supreme Court may be chalra, yaan pe bhi chalra. Shaila Zayas case. Shaila Zayas. Sir, bahut shukriya. Chai ka hai tamahe. Thank you very much. Mere seniors bhi yaan maujood hai. Aur Siddiqui sir to Shreef Laya hai. Very welcome. What we learned today is the mandamus is an activity and what I mean probation is anti-activity and sociality is to uh, rectify or to correct the uh, order passed by some authority and it is not an alternative of uh, revision or appeal jurisdiction. Thank you very much sir. Aaj ko to yahi isko conclude karte hain. Aage in jizon pe mazid kaam karenge. Chai ka hai tamam hai. Aap sab se request hai. Aapka bahut shukriya sir. Thank you very much.